The Kentucky Derby is coming this weekend, and this one will be a special anniversary for the event. Plus, an NFL owner turned down a $10 billion offer, and Fox is planning to break records with its Super Bowl ad prices. It's Thursday, May 2nd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. With the NFL more popular than just about anything in the U.S., the major media networks more and more dependent on it for viewers and subscribers, and the number of teams capped for now at 32, it is difficult to put a ceiling on the values of the teams themselves. We got the latest evidence of that from a report from USA Today that Miami Dolphins owner Stephen Ross was recently offered $10 billion for the team, Hard Rock Stadium, and the Miami F1 race. By comparison, the Washington Commanders sold last year for $6 billion, but that was just for the team in the stadium, and it's well known that the Commanders are looking for a new home. Hard Rock, on the other hand, has received a billion dollars in maintenance and renovations from Ross over the last 16 years, which has helped the stadium be a major destination for events during the 356 days that the Dolphins don't have a home game. In addition to the F1 race, which Ross owns, the stadium hosts Super Bowls, college football national championships, the Miami Open, the Copa America final this summer, and World Cup games in 2026. Add that all up, and it was enough for Ross to turn down the $10 billion offer. We're still nine months away from the next Super Bowl, but Fox is already making plans for their broadcast. Specifically, they plan to charge advertisers at least $7 million for a 30-second spot. If those prices hold, that will be a record. For the last big game, CBS charged an average of $6.5 million for 30 seconds of fame, which itself was a big increase from $5.8 million the year before. I've heard differing opinions on whether it's worth it to spend that much money on a 30-second spot versus spreading it around in more targeted ways, but the Super Bowl is the closest a company can get to speaking to all of America at the same time, and some are willing to pay the premium. This past February's game averaged 123.7 million viewers, and 200 million people watched at least some of the game. With viewer habits increasingly fragmented, the Super Bowl is a singular event, and for now, it's safe to assume that prices are going to keep going up. Very excited to be joined now by Todd Trupp, anchor on FanDuel TV. Welcome, Todd. Oh, and thank you for uh, having me. It's my favorite time of year. Obviously, uh, with horse racing, uh, most of the time out of the year, other sports tend to uh, get the headlines, but it's nice to be at a time of year where horse racing's front and center in the sporting world. Yeah, it's your moment. And and this is, of course, a, a more special moment than usual is the 150th running of the Kentucky Derby. It's older than nearly any event still happening in America. What does that legacy mean to you? It means everything because, one, uh, I love the connection to history. That's what I've always loved uh, about many sports is looking at the foundation of any sport, be it baseball, be it basketball, the NHL. Um, I have a great reverence for where things began and where they're going. And so this 150th anniversary of the Kentucky Derby lets you look back at where we've been. But what you can't help but notice when you go to Churchill Downs, they have a brand new paddock. It is a multi-million dollar renovation, and it is awe-inspiring. Uh, the new paddock at Churchill Downs is essentially taking Churchill Downs beyond the 21st century. And so one day we'll be talking about, I'd like to be here for it, a Derby 300. Um, so while we're looking to the past, uh, you can't help but look around Churchill Downs now in the modernization of the paddock and uh, uh, think about future generations that will be here for this truly American race. Yeah, and I want to hit on both the old and the new here, but staying with the history for a moment, how do you feel that when you when you walk around Churchill Downs, you know, and when you see the race itself, how, what's the how, how do you kind of experience that long history of the Derby? You're surrounded by it. You can't help but feel it uh, when you're in the presence of Churchill Downs. Uh, the most significant part of Churchill Downs and what everybody identifies the building with is the Twin Spires. Those Twin Spires are still represented with the original grandstand that is somewhat dwarfed by the new developments that are around it. But as you go into that grandstand and you go around the facility, there are reminders everywhere of the greats that have come before you. Um, I think if you look at any endeavor, be it on the industrial side, be it on the sporting side, we are all carried in on the shoulders of giants that came before us, truly innovators. Um, and when you look at the Kentucky Derby and how it has changed over the 150 years, when you arrive, 
you are immediately greeted by the history that has been there for the 150 years. And I would say anyone who goes to Churchill Downs, they have to go to the Kentucky Derby Museum. It is not off the grounds. It's connected right to the racetrack. And when you go to the Kentucky Derby Museum, obviously there are collectibles from over the years, but they have a great video presentation about some of the great derbies over the years and what it means. Churchill does a very good job of uh, taking its history and uh, helping people to understand why the Kentucky Derby is so significant and why it has a bright future. And yeah, actually, if you could say a little bit more about that, um, what what does this event mean in American history? Well, when you look at uh, how America was settled, the horse settled most of America. Uh, before we obviously had cars and uh, before the Industrial Revolution, it was horses everywhere. And the horse was part of everyone's life. Almost every citizen um, had access to a horse or needed a horse uh, to basically run their daily lives. The American quarter horse settled the great American West. Um, and when you go back since the beginning of you know, civilization and you look at what horses have meant to different societies, uh, there has always been a horse and there has always been equine sports. And so here in the United States, Churchill Downs and the Kentucky Derby are a connection to our past. And I've been to a lot of great horse racing events over the years. In the quarter horse world, one of the big, biggest events is the All-American Futurity. And it's a different feel than what you have in thoroughbred racing for the Kentucky Derby, but it is connected at its roots in the same way. And that is, it is a reminder that horses have a lot to do with where America was and still a reminder of where America is going. Uh, the horses always meant a lot to our society writ large. And so the Kentucky Derby by extension is just one thing that great thoroughbreds can do. Uh, equine athletes are talented in many ways. Uh, on a daily basis, you can have racehorses that retire from racing, but then they go on to second careers. They could be hunter jumpers. They could be police horses. Um, they could be leisure horses. Um, horses are talented in so many ways and affect our society and are woven in the fabric of it more than people realize. And I think the Kentucky Derby is a reminder of just how magnificent these equine athletes are. And I'm assuming you know um, what what cars were called when they first came on the scene, you know, so many years ago. They're horseless carriages. Yeah, as, that's right. Know, <laughs> that was, you know, was, you know, the main reference point people had of, you know, how do you get around? Um, getting to the Derby itself, if you want the full Derby experience, how long are you there and what does that experience involve? Oh, and you bring up probably the most important point because uh, some people think, okay, the Derby's Saturday, so I'm just going to be there on Saturday. But in truth, a lot of people go for the entire week and racing will start on Tuesday. And it's unique how Churchill has packaged it. So you have racing Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, before the Kentucky Derby on Saturday. So there's all kinds of racing action with top horses taking place. But on Tuesday, they've tried to really market it towards locals. Uh, the area code is 502, so they call it 502 Tuesday. Uh, Thursday is referred to as Thurby. That used to be the main local day, um, and then it became so big they came up with 502 Tuesday. And then Friday is Oaks Day. Uh, we'll be talking about three-year-old Colts on Saturday going a mile and a quarter in the 150th Kentucky Derby. But for as long as there's been a Kentucky Derby, there's been a Kentucky Oaks. So on Friday, it's female racehorses. It's three-year-old fillies going a mile and an eighth. And Oaks Day used to be the local day, and then it became so big that now it has become kind of a two-day event. But I would say to anyone who wants to go, even if you just have tickets for Saturday on the Kentucky Derby, come in early to Louisville because... The best part of the week is what they call Dawn at the Downs. You can be there for training hours early in the morning, and you can see those same horses that are going to be racing on Saturday in the Kentucky Derby go through their final preparations on the main track. And there's nothing more majestic than uh, watching a sunrise at Churchill Downs. And so Dawn at the Downs, to me, in the days leading up to the Kentucky Derby is just as compelling as anything you'll probably see on Saturday. So if you're going to spend the money to uh, come to the Kentucky Derby, definitely come a few days in advance. 
go to Don at the Downs, experience all of Louisville. There's so much to see and do in the area outside of Churchill Downs. Um, so it really shouldn't just be a one day event for somebody. We always hear about the horses. When you hear about the, the winner of the Kentucky Derby, it's the name of the horse. Are jockeys, I mean, are they just as celebrated? Like, are there celebrity jockeys out in the horse racing world too? Oh, yeah. In fact, you know, you look at other countries and how jockeys are viewed. For example, in Japan, they're the equivalent of any Major League Baseball star we would have over here. They're, they are revered. And here in the United States, it takes somebody to win the Kentucky Derby to get the recognition that they deserve. When Rich Strike pulled off his shocking upset just two years ago, uh, the jockey was Sonny Leon. And, and if you followed racing, you kind of knew him, but even people who followed racing really didn't know him. And then uh, I was told a great story by Larry Colmas, who is the track announcer and calls uh, the Kentucky Derby on NBC. He was in a local steakhouse that night and Sonny Leon walked in and the entire restaurant stood and applauded him. And that is somebody who had toiled on minor racetracks. Nobody ever knew him. He had success. And then there he was on a national stage winning the biggest race that thoroughbred racing has to offer. And uh, his life has never been the same. He will always be remembered as a Kentucky Derby winning jockey. And we have a trainer, Steve Asmussen, who's set just about every record you could have in the sport. He's the all-time winning his trainer. He's won more races in one season than anybody. He's won more races in his career, obviously, than anybody. But the one thing he cannot lay claim to is winning the Kentucky Derby. And if you are someone who's involved in this sport, just in my perspective, when you meet people who are sports fans who are aware of the Kentucky Derby, their first question to me is, have you been to the Kentucky Derby? So it's the same thing for people who are trainers, who are jockeys, the question will always be, have you won the Kentucky Derby? It really defines a career. It's only one race, but it is the one race that literally everyone knows. Uh, last year, there was a spate of horse deaths and injuries, which caused Churchill Downs to suspend operations for a period. Has the industry gotten better at horse safety? Oh, without a doubt. In fact, I've been involved with horse racing since I was 17 years old. I, I knew immediately it's what I wanted to do. I started out in customer service in Canterbury. So I, I come with a perspective of having been involved for 37 years now. And so I can tell you without a doubt, it is the safest period in time for horse racing. The horse has always been first, but there's been a development in technology. There's also been a concerted effort by the industry to do more. And uh, I couldn't be associated uh, with an industry that didn't put the horse first. It goes back to what you and I talked about. The horse has meant a lot to us as a country. It's meant a lot to individuals. They're magnificent animals. And uh, horse racing has made it a priority, a number one priority, especially with HISA, the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Act, uh, to do more and do all that we can. And so I'm very comfortable with where we're at. And uh, Churchill did the right thing uh, in that period of time that you talked about, um, they moved racing up to Ellis Park uh, and uh, they made the adjustments they needed to make. And is there any consensus around what was going on last year? You know, sometimes it's just happenstance. Um, I know because I'm based out in Southern California uh, when they had a situation at Santa Anita, which was about six years ago now, it was a confluence of events. There's never easy answers uh, with these situations. Uh, I know in California, it was certainly weather related as far as what uh, brought on the spat of injuries that we had there. So then you had to look at the track, then you had to look at protocols uh, for horses before they went into races. And so I believe California out of that experience gave a roadmap to the rest of the industry about how we can be better and uh, how we can make it as safe as possible. And uh, so I'm very proud of what the industry is doing, especially after these difficult circumstances. These difficult circumstances have brought the industry together for a cause that's truly the most important. Without the horse, there's no industry. And without safe racing, um, none of us would want to be involved. And recently, Zidane Racing st Stables lost an appeals court ruling. And the result of that is that Muff, a horse trained by Bob Baffert, will not be able to race in the Kentucky Derby because Baffert is still suspended. What's Baffert's status in the racing world at this point? Is he kind of a persona non grata? Well, you know, in certain, uh, in certain regions, you, that would be a fair statement. But I do think there has been a division within the industry, some who believe 
that Bob Baffert has paid his penalty, um, that his, uh, his transgressions are not as um, egregious as what has been portrayed in some parts of the media, uh, but there's a certain segment of the industry, a large segment of the industry, that supports his return to coming back to the Kentucky Derby. But in the end, it's Churchill Downs' decision, and they represent another group in the industry uh, that believes that maybe Bob needs to serve a longer time. I'm hoping that this year is the end of his ban for the Kentucky Derby. It's been three years now. Um, I, I do see a different Bob Baffert because I'm out in California, and so I encounter him on a pretty consistent basis. Um, he's more contrite. He's... Uh, made changes in his barn that he believes is uh, going to make a difference in how people view his operation. Uh, but we have this unique situation, as you said, Muth won the, the Arkansas Derby, is considered one of the best three-year-olds in the country, and he's not going to be in the Kentucky Derby. So you're already taking out one of the best three-year-olds, and this is the race that is supposed to define who's the best three-year-old in the country. So Bob will reemerge at the Preakness with a horse like Muth, he has another horse in his barn, uh, Nisos, who uh, is taking some time off, but is considered one of the best three-year-olds out there. He wouldn't have been able to run in the Kentucky Derby. So, you know, when you talk about there's one group that supports Bob, there's another group uh, that still feels that he has uh, a ways to go. Well, the Triple Crown kind of exemplifies that. He's not allowed at the Kentucky Derby, but two weeks after the Kentucky Derby, the second jewel of the Triple Crown, the Preakness, uh, he's welcome with open arms. And before we let you go, just what are you most excited for for the race? Uh, I have to tell you, since I <laughs> I mentioned I got in horse racing when I was a teenager, and I would watch the Kentucky Derby on TV with everyone else, and when they played my old Kentucky home, I would get goosebumps. And so then to go and see it in person uh, has meant the world to me, to work for FanDuel TV, to be on site all week long and all the lead up that we have. Uh, I'm a fan. I, I'm a fan. I may be working, but I'm a fan. That uh, post parade where they sing my old Kentucky home, the mornings leading up uh, to Kentucky Derby Day, uh, there's so much I love to take in, but those those are two of my favorites. Uh, Don at Churchill Downs and the preparations, and then when they all sing my old Kentucky home in the post parade, it's, it's awesome. It, it really is something that if you're a sports fan, it should be on your list and you should check it off. Get to the Kentucky Derby. All right. Todd Tripp, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Oh, and thank you. That's it for today. Subscribe and leave us a rating or review wherever you like to tune in. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.